So last lab, last Thursday, uh, we finished the lab with the following question. What do we use these EBMs for? <laughs> Everywhere. So what is a practical application where this kind of many-to-many -many or one-to-many is required? So, uh, so we're going to see some examples today um, in structure prediction. Uh, so whenever, whenever there is a latent variable. Uh, to some extent, you've already used energy-based models in the sense that there is an interpretation of classifiers as actually energy-based models where you, uh, when you, when you plug the scores coming out of a classifier, right, before you run into the softmax, your scores that go into a classifier, you can interpret those scores as energies. Or the as logic, right? energies if, you, if you think of them as, if the, if the softmax you know, doesn't have a minus sign in front, then the, the scores are, the weighted sums before you go into the softmax can be interpreted as negative energies. Um, so when you, when you go through the softmax and you minimize the, the, the log loss, the, the log, um, uh, you know, the, the log of the score that your system gives to the correct answer, right? Which is what, what we do whenever we do classification very often. The effect of this, because of the softmax, is going to be to push up on the score of the correct answer and push down on the scores of the others because of the normalization factor. Mm -hmm. And so you can see this as a form of contrastive energy-based learning, okay? It's implicit because the softmax does this for you. But, um, uh, but really, that's, what ha that's what's happening. There is one, one score that's being pushed up or negative energy that's being pushed up, which means that energy is being pushed down. And then everything else um, is being pushed in the other direction. Uh, so that's, it's just an interpretation, right? Now, this interpretation becomes really crucial when you have latent variables. And we'll see some examples, some practical examples today when, when you have latent variables in things like speech recognition and um, handwriting and a lot of other applications. But in the first uh, part of the lab, we saw that we have like one to many, right? We have one X and given the X location, we have the whole uh, ellipse for that location, right? So yeah. what could be like a, an application of the fact that we have one input, but a continuous set of outputs? Right. So, um, so now this is a topic that has become very, very popular over the last few years. And we'll, we'll talk about it probably. We probably won't have time today, but probably next time on uh, this idea of self-supervised learning. So th this idea of uh, contrastive learning uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, last, year, last, uh, last week um, becomes intractable or complicated or infeasible when the number of alternatives to the correct answer becomes either very large or, or infinite or combinatorial, okay? Mm -hmm. So imagine that now the correct answer is a sentence because you're doing translation. And what you have to push down on the, you know, you have to, to, push, to push down the energy of the correct answer and push up on the energy of every possible sentence. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can't do this, right? Because you don't have a way of enumerating. I mean, you do have a way of enumerating all possible sentences, but there's an infinite number. And even if you limit yourself to a finite size, there's an exponentially growing number with the size. So it's, it's basically impossible, right? Okay. So now you have to think, what am I going to do? I can't do... I can do softmax over the collection of all things. Uh, so I'm going to have to cut corners. And mm -hmm. uh, either you cut corners while trying to stick to the probabilistic interpretation of all this, or you say, OK, I'm not going to be able to stick to the probabilistic framework. So I'm just going to say I have a bunch of scores. and need to push down the you know, energies. I'm going to push down on the energy of the correct thing and push up on other things, hope, you know, and crossing my fingers that uh, I'm going to push up on n of things that uh, the, the, the energy function will only give low energy to stuff I train it on. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it, because, because, you know, the, the probabilistic approach becomes intractable when you have uh, a, a potential, potentially infinite or just combinatorially large uh, number of possible answers, you kind of have to resort to those uh, other interpretation. And, uh, and the experience, you know, from the last, almost 30 years now, 25 years at least, shows that uh, you should get rid of the probabilistic interpretation when you do this because um, it leads to uh, over-constrained problems if you really want to stick to it. Um, there's something called a label bias, which I might talk about today. Okay, I trust um, you on that. 
so, you know, that's a little more about the, the motivation. Now, the problem becomes even more dire when what you're trying to predict is a continuous uh, variable like an image. Okay. Uh, so you, you want to do video prediction. You know, mm -hmm. For example, here's a practical application. You want to uh, build a system that can compress videos uh, very well. Okay. So the best way to compress a video is to look at the past video that has already been transmitted and then try to predict what the next frame is going to be. Okay. You have a smart system that, you know, knows about objects and predicts where, you know, everything is going to be in the next frame. Uh, and this prediction, of course, will depend on some latent variable because you can't exactly predict what's going to happen from the previous frames. You know, there are things that will happen that are eminently unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have latent variables that basically parameterize the, the set of possible things that could happen that you can't, you can't predict which one will happen, right? Yeah, I see. Um, so now your compression system will, will just need to transmit the value of those latent variables. Hopefully it's a small number. Uh, compress that and transmit it. And then the decoder at the other end will be able to decode the frame without having you know, to know all the pixels, essentially, um, just by being given those latent variables. Uh, in a way, conceptually, this is actually how video compression works, except those, those predictors are built by hand. They're not trained, although there are a lot of startups now that are working on this. Um, and there's you know, projects at Facebook on this as well. Um, um, so. Uh, now, uh, the main application, though, of, of this, of predicting continuous, uh, high dimensional continuous things, uh, or an energy based model where the, the variable to be predicted is, uh, is a high dimensional thing like an image, uh, the main application of this is self supervised learning. So, what you want to do is train a system to learn good features without having to resort to label samples. Okay, so we talked about joint embedding like last times briefly, uh -huh. I'm gonna talk, talk about it again today a little bit, where you have, you know, Siamese nets, so two networks that are identical and you show it two different versions of the same image by distorting one of them or both. And then you train the system to produce the same output for those two images so that it's invariant to those uh, transformations. And then there is another phase, a contrastive phase where you show two examples that are different and then you push the two output vectors away from each other. The distance between the output vectors is the energy. And you can, you can think of this as a contrastive method where uh, you, know, you want to make the energy for a pair of compatible images low mm -hmm. and the energy for a pair of incompatible images large. And the problem, of course, is that you have a potentially infinite number of negative images. Yeah. So now you have to be smart about how you pick those images so that you, know, you push things and, and ends up working. Um, and, and this is best understood in the context of energy-based model. You, you can't really sort of have a, a correct probability formulation of this. Okay. All right. I think enough motivation for... Uh, oh, there is a question here from Alan. So is this similar to interpolation? Well, I mean, all of machine learning is similar to interpolation if you want, right? Um, you know, uh, when you train a, a linear regression, right, uh, on scalar values, right, you're, you're, you're training a model, right? You're, you're giving a bunch of pairs, X and Y, and, you, and you're, you're asking what are the best values of A and B for, you know, Y equals AX plus B that minimizes the, the, the square error of the prediction of a line to all of the points, right? That's linear regression. Um, that's interpolation. All of machine learning is interpolation. In fact, you know, much of machine learning. So here is an important point that you're going to get a bigger answer than you than you asked for, um, which is that in a high dimensional space, there is essentially no such thing as interpolation. Everything is extrapolation. Um, so imagine you are in you know in a space of images, right? So you have a color images, two fifty six by two fifty six. Um, that's you know. 200,000 pixels or something, or, you know, input values, right? That's 64,000 pixels, but 65,000. Um, so it's 200,000 uh, dimensional uh, input space. Uh, even if you have a million samples, you're only covering a tiny portion of the dimensions mm -hmm. uh, of that space, right? Th those images are in a, a tiny sliver of, of surface among the, the, the space of all possible combinations of values of pixels. And so what you're doing when, when you show the system a new image, it's very unlikely that this image is a linear combination of previous images. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means what you're doing is extrapolation, not interpolation. Okay. And in how you mentioned, all of machine learning is extrapolation, which is why it's hard. Okay. I see. So this doesn't have much to do with energy based models. <laughs> Uh, are, are we reading the other other question here? How well supervised? But yeah, I, I'd rather not answer that question now. We'll we'll talk about self supervised you some more. So th there'll be like you know a whole lecture on this, pretty much. Okay. Okay. Um, or in fact, I'll talk about this in the first hour today. So maybe you'll get your answer. If you don't, then ask me again. All right. Awesome. Okay. Then I disappear right. and I let you uh, teach the class. <laughs>